All right, today we're going to talk about forest management policy, the different kinds of policies that govern the way that we manage resources in the forest. Uh, we're going to start out by focusing on the federal government and the policies that they have in place that um, dictate the management that we have on nationally owned or federally owned land, which is primarily, um, if it's forested, going to be owned by the U.S. Forest Service, owned and managed by the U.S. Forest Service. So um, as we get started with this discussion, I want to first introduce this idea about public trust resources. So public trust resources is kind of a philosophy that we have in many parts of the Western world and other places as well um, that dates back to the Byzantine Empire. And as I said, it's kind of a philosophy that's held by many, many different um, countries in the Western Hemisphere, as, as well as some others as well. And the idea is that there are resources that are within our countries that cannot be individually owned. And instead, these resources should be held in common and they should be managed by the government of a particular country, which is, of course, supposed to be a representation of the people of that country. And they're held in trust um, by the government um, because they're too valuable for any one individual to have, you know, the rights to manipulate them in a way that might be not to the advantage of other people that live in the society. So, um, again, these are just considered too valuable, so we don't want to allow individuals to start to manipulate them in ways that we can't all agree with. And so these resources that are public trust resources are things like water, air, tide lands, um, wildlife um, are considered public trust resources in many places as well. And so, for instance, if you own a piece of private property, um, like I own a piece of private property that has a couple small streams that run through it, I don't own the water in those streams, nor do I own the air above my property. Um, and if I lived along um, a big river or along a coastline where there was land um, that water kind of came up onto and then receded back from, and there was kind of a beach or a tidal land there, I wouldn't actually own that land even if it was surrounded by, by my private property. So I might own access, you know, the way that people could get to that particular point, um, but I don't actually own those lands. And um, in California, wildlife is also considered um, a public trust resource. So if a deer comes on my property, I don't own that deer and I don't have the right to kill that deer without consulting with the rules of the government um, that, again, ideally are supposed to be set up um, in a way that is um, a compromise between all the people in the society and their values regarding wildlife. So um, kind of this idea of public trust resources is basically what gives um, us the authority um, as a society and as the government representations of us in our society to regulate a lot of what goes on in forests um, because what we're not actually regulating um, so much is exactly what people choose to do with the wood um, on their property, but we're, what we're regulating or the authority that we have to regulate the decisions that they make ties back to the fact that we want to make sure that the decisions they make are not negatively affecting the water that's going to flow downstream onto other people's um, public and private property, the air, the Thailands, the wildlife that don't belong to the people even if they own that private property. So we are regulating what they do to ensure that the decisions that they make don't have an undue adverse effect on these public trust resources that belong to all of us. So anyway, just kind of want to set up the philosophical um, background for regulation of environmental resources. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk, talk about the regulation of Forest Service property first. Um, and so here's a map of California, and the areas in dark green are Forest Service property. And you can see there's quite a bit of Forest Service property throughout California, particularly in the mountainous areas of the Sierra, of the Klamath Mountains, and then also down in Southern California and some of the transverse ranges like the San Bernardino, San Gabriel Mountains. 
Um, and uh, of course, these are areas where there's forest. So a lot of the other parts of California that don't have forest service land are like the Central Valley or kind of the southeastern deserts of California um, where there's not forest. So it wouldn't have really made sense for the forest service to own and manage those types of properties. So um, properties that are owned and managed by the Forest Service um, are not subject to state law. So even though the, uh, re many of the properties that are owned by the Forest Service are within the state of California, federal law trumps state law. And so they set their own regulation that's different from the regulations that we have from the state. Another thing that's important to understand about the Forest Service especially the history of the Forest Service, is that the Forest Service originally was set up and continues to be part of the Department of Agriculture in our federal government, not the Department of the Interior, which is the agency that manages uh, many other federal agencies that work with federal lands, like the National Park Service, the USGS, etc. So the Department of the Interior has a slightly different mission um, you know, about managing lands for the future, for people, for recreation, whereas at least historically, the Department of Agriculture is set up to, you know, help us support the process of growing crops, growing plants that we need for specific human uses. And of course, a lot of agricultural effort goes into growing food, but growing wood and pulp for paper Kind of is another form of agriculture. And so, again, at least historically, that was really the mission of the Forest Service, was producing wood for the needs of Americans. Um, and we're not gonna get into a whole lesson about the history of the Forest Service. And originally there was a system of forest reserves that were set up, lands that were set aside by the federal government. And then they kind of set up this agency, the Forest Service, to manage um, those lands. Um, but that's a topic for a different class. But I do want to mention um, a guy named Gifford Pinchot, who was the first director of the U.S. Forest Service. And he kind of set the tone for a lot of what the mission of the Forest Service was about. And he said, we should be managing the resources in our forest, which kind of, again, within an agricultural context, we're growing wood for use for people. But we want to go about doing that in a way where we can provide the greatest good for the greatest number of people for the longest time. So this is kind of his famous quote. And this kind of sets the tone for having what ideally should be sustainable man, uh, management of our landscapes. And then also kind of sets the tone for conservation of resources. So again, kind of a topic for a different class, but um, the Park Service, for instance, um, is set up with a little bit of a different philosophy where they're kind of trying to preserve resources as they are, whereas the mission of the Forest Service is not necessarily to preserve things in a specific state, but it's to use things to provide good to people, but to do that in a way that our current management decisions don't negatively impact the ability of future generations to reap those same resources um, from the landscape. So we want to make sure that we're managing our lands in a way that's not just benefiting a few people, not just benefiting people today, but is going to continue to allow that benefit to affect many, many people all around our country, and not only today, but into the future. So that's the goal that the Forest Service has. Um, so, uh, the Forest Service, or at least the Forest Reserves, date back to late 1800s, but kind of the modern era of Forest Service management can be tied back to the 1960s, um, and in particular 1960, when the Multiple Use and Sustained Yield Act was passed, sometimes called MUSIA, and what the Multiple Use and Sustained Yield Act dictated was that the Forest Service should be managing its lands in a way that it wasn't only focusing on producing wood or timber, but it should be focused on multiple uses and making sure that those multiple uses would be accessible to people, again, not only at the time that the management is happening, but also into the future. 
And these multiple different goals that the Forest Service should have um, were, uh, there's five main ones. They're often referred to as the five W's. And so the five W's include wood. We obviously are managing the forest in a way to grow trees. But we should also be considering the management of water. We need to consider water quality and water quantity. We also need to be considering wildlife. And then we have a little bit of a stretch where we have sometimes wequiation, <laughs> silent W there, and wange. So we also need to be managing our lands in a way that they're accessible for um, Americans to recreate in. And there's a lot of different kinds of recreation that we have. And there's different ways that we manage the lands, like wilderness areas and other areas that are accessible to motorized vehicles that allow for multiple different kinds of recreation. Um, and then also uh, a lot of Forest Service land is also rangeland. So a lot of um, private um, owners of cattle or sheep or other herds of animals have permits to graze their animals, especially in the summer, on lands that are owned by the U.S. Forest Service. So there's those five W's that we all need to consider side by side and anytime we're um, making management decisions about what to do in the forest, we need to consider how the forest will be impacted in all five of these ways. And then also, of course, we have to consider not only the impacts today, but the impacts into the future. So that's the kind of sustained yield component of this policy. And um, in the sustained yield part, um, the Forest Service has laid out this mission that says, the achievement and maintenance and perpetuity of a high level annual or regular periodic output of the various renewable resources, so not just the periodic output of wood, but the output of water and wildlife, recreation opportunities, range opportunities, of the national forest without impairment of the productivity of the land. So we wanna make sure that into the future, the land will still be able to produce water for us, be a home to wildlife that we wanna see on the landscape, provide recreational opportunities, and provide um, range um, and forage opportunities for um, range land animals. So this kind of sets, sets the stage for modern forest management. So um, to think more specifically about how this affects our region, um, we're within the Sierra Nevada. Um, and so in 2001, the Sierra Nevada Forest Plan Amendment to the Sierra Nevada framework kind of laid out the specific management and regulations that dictate what goes on on the different forests within the Sierra Nevada. So there are 11 different national forests. Um, you know, around here we have the Plumas, the Lassen, the Tahoe, but there's also El Dorado, Sierra, and so on and so forth. And combined, um, these uh, national forest lands in the Sierra Nevada cover 11.5 million acres, so that's a, quite a bit of property. And um, a lot of public input went into the creation of this plan because, again, these are publicly owned lands. And you might remember Maurice mentioned the fact that as a public servant managing public lands, we have to always provide opportunities for the public to comment and give input onto the management decisions that we're making. So after 47,000 public comments that Forest Service employees went through, 60 public meetings, 10 years of scientific research conducted both by employees of the Forest Service and outside agencies, they put together this plan that is still the main plan that's dictating management today, um, you know, more than 10 years later. And what some of the main regulations that were set up by this plan um, were as follows. One, um, where we had old growth stands, which as we've mentioned before is a little bit of a complicated issue of how we define that, but where we basically had late seral stands, um, late seral stage stands that hadn't been cut over by European Americans of greater than one acre. So not just if you had one tree or two trees, but you really started to have a stand, um, we shouldn't go in and cut in those areas. The idea is that so many of those have already been removed. Where they're left, they're a unique resource that we should maintain. 
So that covered about 4.25 million acres of land that's managed as old forests that we're supposed to be preserving, leaving alone. Um, another thing that this particular um, rule said was that we can't cut trees of greater than 20 inches dbh and as you'll see there's been a little bit of backfighting back and forth between 20 inches dbh and 30 inches dbh has been an upper limit um, also it encouraged managers to emphasize fuels reduction as a main goal in managing resources fuels reduction should help us improve the production of wood and water quality and wildlife habitat and recreational opportunities and range opportunities, right? If we don't have forests burning down in severe fires. Um, it also required forest service managers to consider stream buffers, areas around streams where they weren't driving equipment. So there's a little bit of variability, but generally a 300 foot stream buffer is required. And then it also required that we make specific plans for the preservation of wildlife and aquatic habitat. Um, so in particular, there are certain species that are either federally listed um, or um, state listed, or sometimes we just have species that are considered species of special concern by the Forest Service that aren't currently listed as endangered or threatened, but the Forest Service recognizes are having relatively small populations and so they want to manage them in a way that they make sure they don't end up getting on the endangered list and so um, around here we have three species that probably garner the most attention which include the california spotted owl the northern goshawk and the fisher um, which is a little kind of large weasel um, and these are species that we have special kind of habitat conservation plans for that we need to consider um, when we're deciding what to do with our forest resources. Okay, so um, it's also important to remember that there's a lot of other laws that aren't kind of internal forest service regulations that are gonna be dictating and influencing um, what people can do on the landscape. Um, and this is gonna affect private property as well as forest service property. But a couple other federal environmental laws that I want to mention are NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act of 1970, which basically says that federal governments need to um, make an impact assessment of all the kinds of projects that they're doing um, to consider the environmental impacts that those projects may have. So NEPA today is kind of a planning process that Forest Service people will have to go through to say, hey, we want to come in and cut down these trees. Okay, if we do that, what are going to be the impacts? Are there alternatives? Um, you know, are we willing to live with these impacts and try to give a kind of realistic representation of what that is? Then they have to publish these documents so that the public has an opportunity to read and comment on them. Um, and then they have to kind of incorporate those comments before they make a final plan. So anyway, that's what NEPA is all about. Um, uh, the Clean Water Act, which was passed a couple years later in 1970, CWA Clean Water Act, um, identifies impaired waterways and manages what we consider non-point source pollutions as well as point source pollutant sources. So what that means is instead of just focusing on things like sewer outflow pipes that are clearly places where pollution is getting into the environment. The Clean Water Act said we need to consider um, different kinds of things that are going on in the landscape that might be le um, letting uh, in diffuse pollutants to our stream. So for instance, operating heavy equipment on forest landscapes and building roads on forested landscapes is not occurring at a specific point, it's occurring over broad regions, but those activities can still have the potential to impair waterways. So we need to think about the way that we're doing that and try to approach it in a way that we're um, limiting the amount of sediment and erosion that's getting into water. So that's another thing that's dictating, um, in some cases, what people can do on federal land. Um, and then finally, there's the ESA, Endangered Species Act, passed in 1973, that um, designates certain species as either endangered, kind of critically endangered or threatened on their way to being endangered, 
and says that we need to protect these species and in order to protect them we need to create management plans where we think about um, ensuring that they have the proper habitat that they need to be able to continue to live and hopefully build back up their populations. So um, this is all going on um, in the background and then we have these regional forest and then also land and resource management plans um, that are set up to manage these specific areas, kind of like the Sierra Nevada framework. Okay, so um, after the original um, Sierra Nevada framework plan was passed uh, that we mentioned a couple slides ago, um, there was this really um, horrific wildfire season back in 2002 um, where we had lots of really, really massive fires all the way across the West. And also at the same time, there was a transition within our federal government. We moved from the Clinton administration to the Bush administration. So we had different people um, kind of overseeing the management of federal lands with some different values, different approaches. And so um, they decided at this point to change some of the regulations within the original Sierra Nevada framework and they passed something that was called the Healthy Forest Protection Act that was um, supposed to allow fuel reductions projects and salvage logging, right, remember the cutting down of trees that are already dead, to proceed without an EIS or an environmental impact statement review process. So remember before we mentioned NEPA, this National Environmental Policy Act, which says that we should be um, considering the environmental impacts, weighing our decisions, comparing alternatives before we move forward, allowing the public to comment. And this plan said, that takes too much time. We just need to get in and treat these lands and we wanna do it without having to consider public comment and without having to consider the environmental impacts that may be occurring. So of course, we still have some limitations on what we can do, but we wanna make a much more streamlined process for ourselves. So anyway, you can imagine this was controversial. Some people were excited about this. Some people were not so excited about this. Um, and certainly this allowed for some um, clear cutting of much larger size parcels um, that had been allowed before. And that was particularly unpopular to um, many people who were observing what was going on in their public lands. So then a couple years later, after there's a lot of um, debate in the courts about if this was a good plan or a bad plan, um, they made some revisions to, again, that original Sierra Nevada framework and kind of incorporating some of the ideas of the Healthy Forest Protection Act into it. So in 2004, um, they had this revision that's published and um, this revision uh, reduces the protection for old forest and old growth areas. So before it had said anything that's up to one acre of old growth was supposed to be set aside. Um, this said it had to be much bigger patches than that and I don't remember the limitations off the top of my head. Um, it increased the size of tree that could be cut on the forest up to 30 inches dbh rather than 20 inches dbh so that gave managers a lot more flexibility and um, again there was um, a lot of public opinion right there's a lot of public in the united states we have hundreds of millions of people who all have a right to comment on what we're doing on these forest service lands and so um, after many lawsuits many public comments many public meetings um, finally um, the issues around this were resolved in 2014 and um, in this case some of the new revisions to the forest Sierra Nevada framework were maintained things like we still are allowed to cut trees up to 30 inches but then there were some more stringent environmental protections put in like there was more emphasis put on conservation strategies for um, species of concern like the California spotted owl and the fisher and there was also um, a bigger emphasis on fire reduction and the use of prescribed fire and managed fire to uh, achieve different kinds of ecological benefit, which is something that a lot of ecologists were pushing for. Um, I also just want to mention that um, there is another plan called the Northwest Forest Plan 
that dictates management in a lot of Washington and Oregon, but also is the plan that dictates management coming down into the coastal parts of Northern California. That again is called the Northwest Forest Plan. That dates back to 1994. And we won't get into as much detail about that, but basically some of the big controversies in this area are about the Northern Spotted Owl, not the California Spotted Owl, which is a federally listed species. The California Spotted Owl is not. Um, and in this area, um, in particular, to try to achieve better habitat conservation for the Spotted Owl, there was a lot uh, more emphasis put on conserving late seral stage forests or late successional stage forests, basically what most people think of as old growth um, forests and setting areas that were still in that state um, aside and protecting them so that people couldn't go in and log in those areas. And um, as you can imagine, that was a super controversial decision that was made, um, particularly in this area that had historically um, had a lot of people working in the logging industry. So. Um, another thing that I want to mention um, is kind of about some of the controversy around um, some of these um, forest plans, particularly that Northwest Forest Plan that I mentioned before. And the Northwest Forest Plan, as we mentioned, uh, was concerned with trying to preserve northern spotted owl habitat and these late successional stage or old growth forest stands that were deemed necessary to protect owls. And so in 1990, when these owls were originally listed, it didn't stop the timber industry in any way. People have been cutting through the whole time, but it did slow the rate of cutting and certainly slow the rate of cutting of certain sizes of trees and in certain specific localities um, that were set aside for protection, um, you know, had impacts on the way that the community was able to harvest resources from the forest. Um, and in 1991, in particular, there was this um, most kind of extreme point of regulation where there was kind of a, a stopping um, or a freezing of harvesting on U.S. Forest Service lands that contained the owl Why they kind of thought about what they needed to do to proceed. So that um, hiatus has, has been lifted. It didn't last for a long time, but you can imagine it really sparked a lot of controversy and a lot of anger among people that um, had jobs working, cutting wood in the forest or processing that wood that was coming out of the forest. And so 1990, um, kind of leading up to all this heated um, debate is sometimes called the Redwood Summer um, in Northern California, in the very parts of Southern Oregon where we had redwoods. Um, there was a lot of uh, people and a lot of tension kind of coming to a head around what we should be doing and the way that we should be managing our forests. Um, so here's some pictures of people that were um, feeling on the side of the timber industry, feeling frustrated with the increase in environmental regulation. So you can see um, here's a guy in Fort Bragg um, who supports the timber industry, who's pissed off with people who are trying to come in and weigh in on the way that the timber industry was managing lands and particularly managing forest service lands, public lands. Um, and anyone who's grown up in Plumas County has maybe seen this kind of thing. The spotted owl helper, kind of a play on um, hamburger helper um, that you still see in a lot of kind of old bars um, around Plumas County and other kind of timber places. And this kind of gives the impression that, you know, people were really giving a fuck you to the spotted owl and the way that it was determining um, what was going on in their lives and in their forests. So these people weren't happy. Um, on the other hand, there was a lot of people who were concerned about the way that the forest was being managed um, that were also unhappy. Um, so in particular, there's organizations like Earth First um, that were working to try to protect some of these old growth trees and protect these old growth habitats. Um, and you may have heard of people like Julia Butterfly Hill that lived in a redwood tree. Um, I forget how long, like two years, at least a year, um, to try to make sure that the tree wasn't cut down. I think the tree's name was Luna. Um, and it was a big tree. She, she knew that if she was up there, they wouldn't cut the tree down because they wouldn't want to kill her. Obviously, that wouldn't be in anyone's best interest. So uh, anyway, there's a lot of protesting about the way that the forest was being managed. 
and um, as uh, emotions ran high, there were bad decisions that were made on both sides um, of these communities. So for instance, one thing that a lot of environmental groups would do is they would go and they would drive these big metal stakes into trees um, that were going to be cut down, that were slated to be cut down, that they thought shouldn't be cut down. And the idea behind that is that when people were coming to cut down the trees, they would um, harm the people. They would, you know, break chainsaws, break blades, slow the process of harvesting, or um, potentially hurt the people that were trying to cut down trees, or when these trees got to the mill, it would break mill equipment and potentially hurt people as well. So here's a particular article um, that talks about a tree that was cut down um, by Louisiana Pacific, a forestry company up in the northwestern part of California, and um, the, I'll just read it, a tree cut down in a forest service owned Force owned by Louisiana Pacific near Elk was going through a large bandsaw when the jagged tooth blade struck an 11-inch nail that had been driven into the log. The force caused a 10 to 15 foot section of the blade to fly off its track and hit mill worker George Alexander, 23, in the face. And then there's more details about it. He didn't die, but he was obviously badly injured. And um, it says, I think it's an unfortunate that somebody was hurt a comment by an environmentalist, but you know, I was quite honestly more concerned about the old growth forest, the spotted owls, the wolverines, and the salmon, and nobody is forcing people to cut down those trees, says Foreman, somebody from an environmental group. So not having a lot of empathy, obviously this isn't a practice that was looked on um, warmly by many people, so behaving badly on this side. Um, on the other side, um, people uh, or, you know, a group of people from the timber industry were very frustrated with environmental groups and in one case actually set a car bomb um, inside this particular activist car um, in Oakland. So anyway, the point is that emotions were running very high. Fortunately, um, I think a lot of these tensions have calmed down a lot in the last 20 years and we found a lot more room for compromise. Um, in a lot of these forests where we're still um, cutting down trees, recognizing that that is um, a, a benefit to a lot of people in our society, um, but doing it in a way that has a little bit better consideration for environmental resources. Okay, the last thing I want to say about the Forest Service is just to explain to you guys a little bit of um, the kind of qualifications that you need to have to work for the Forest Service in forestry. So the Forest Service, like all government agencies, has these GS values um, that tell you kind of, um, you know, how you are, where you're ranked on the kind of chain of higher ups within the Forest Service. So the very lowest grade of pay and responsibility that you can have in the Forest Service is a GS-1. Um, and you're not likely to get hired on in a job like that, but they do exist. Um, but once you start to have a little bit of education and experience within an area, a common GS grade that you guys might get hired on as would be a GS4 level. So to be qualified to work as a GS4 level, um, for instance, as a seasonal forestry technician on the Plumas or another national forest, what you need is two years of education above high school level, which includes at least 12 semester hours, or basically 12 units, in any combination of the following courses. So forestry, agriculture, crop and plant science, range management or conservation, wildlife management, watershed management, soil science, natural resources, outdoor recreation, civil and forest engineering, wildland fire science. So taking a few classes like forestry, soils, wildlife, um, you know, and having a few of those courses under your belt would qualify you when you apply for these jobs to be actually considered. So when you apply for federal jobs, you apply um, through USA um, Jobs, a big website, and then before the local people actually get a chance to look at your resume, it goes through this kind of federal clearinghouse where people who are not local to the area look through the resumes that are submitted and decide it if the people that are applying actually meet these qualifications. And only if you do meet these qualifications will they continue to forward your application on um, to the local office, with, and then the local office will look through the applications that meet the qualifications and be able to select um, 
people, employees from that subset list. So anyway, um, many of you guys might be qualified to work um, kind of in this range of um, position at the Forest Service. And then um, moving on into the future, many of you guys might start to be qualified to work at a GS-5 level. So these are kind of the entry level full-time forester positions um, where you have a little bit more responsibility. You might be working throughout the winter, not just in the summer, depend, depending on the job. Um, but in this case, you would need a bachelor's degree in forestry or a related subject, um, you know, forest ecology, um, natural resource management, something like that. And of that degree, 30 semester hours would need to be made up of biological, physical, and mathematical sciences. Um, and you would want to have some classes at least in the management of renewable resources, forest biology, forest resources, etc. So getting your bachelor's degree in forestry or a related uh, major would qualify you for that kind of job. Or you can have a combination of education and experience. So maybe you have an AS degree in environmental science um, with 30 semester hours of science-based classes and you have some experience. You've worked in the woods as an intern, you've worked in the woods for a nonprofit, you've worked in the, in the woods um, for an industry, for a logging company, um, for a logger. So you have some experience that we consider um, you know, some sort of, uh, not, not, it's not equivalent to education, it's different than education, but it gives you some knowledge about the way that the forest works and the way that the forest manage, is managed that they would consider valuable. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit more of a loose area, but usually um, if you have an AS degree that they're going to be looking for a couple years of at least seasonal experience of work in the forest in addition to your education to qualify you for this GS5 level. So for instance, I know we've had students from our program that have graduated um, just with an AS degree that have started out working as a GS4 and then have moved up the ranks um, even without getting any more education to GS5. Um, in some cases, even like GS6 positions. Um, but at some point, you're going to run out of your ability to move up the ladder within the Forest Service if you don't um, have more education under your belt. So finally, I just want to mention that through FRC, we have these special internship programs um, with the Plumas National Forest. And these internship programs are designed to allow FRC students only so you are the only people that are eligible to apply for these jobs um, to get uh, jobs with the Forest Service for the summer where you're working as a seasonal technician um, during the FRC summer break um, with various shops within the Forest Service. So we have wildlife positions, forestry positions, civiculture positions, fire positions, um, et cetera, et cetera. And um, in this case, you're actually not a true employee of the Forest Service, you're an employee of a nonprofit, but you're working with Forest Service professionals. So you're gaining the kind of experience that would help you um, kind of get qualifications for Forest Service jobs in the future. Um, but just to make the distinction, you're actually not a Forest Service employee. So you're not like being hired as a GS3 or a GS4, or GS5. You're being hired by this outside nonprofit, but then gaining the kind of experience that would be valuable to you um, if you're going into forestry or another related field. Okay, so uh, next time when we come back, we'll talk about policy in California, but this is kind of an overview of the Forest Service and what we do um, to manage lands that are owned by them. All right.